So uh, let me just do a few things real quick to set up. Uh, as I was telling uh, Daniel, it was, it's a pleasure to speak at a place that I probably couldn't get in as a student. So it's, uh, <laughs> I'm going to try to send a picture to my kids so they accept this. Uh, so let me talk about, I actually think both of us, meaning in the United States here, both experiencing a, the nation state that we know, we study, that we understand, is starting to retreat and atrophy, and that what's emerging is city-states across the globe. And it's one of the reasons, not the reason, but a reason, that I think that you're seeing an interesting period of time in politics. When I ran, I wanted to, as mayor in the city of Chicago, take a world-class city and continue to build it, but more importantly, build it for everybody in the city to be part of a city that's actually emerging. So what I focused on economically when I became mayor, jobs and companies were fleeing the city. We had the shortest school day and the shortest school year in the United States of America. And there was more and more parts of the city that were cut off from a city that was uh, growing. So I set out two things, a couple things, and focusing on economics first, and then I'll get to education, which was the principal reason I decided to run for mayor, which was the fact is that we had lost jobs, lost companies, not just in the recession, but over the period of time. So I've actually took a study. I asked McKinsey to do a study for the city of Chicago, what worked, what didn't work over the last 10 years, and going forward, what would be the most important thing to do. While they were doing that study, they identified a couple key factors not different than when you uh, both Economist Magazine, IBM, A.T. Kearney all did studies about 100 cities across the globe. In each of those studies, they found that the city of Chicago was the second most competitive economy in North America and either ninth, eighth, or seventh worldwide. And of the 10 top cities in the world, Chicago was the only one on the top 10 list that was not the financial or political capital of the respective country. So what would take a city that wasn't either the financial or political capital, but vaulted it to the second most competitive economy and in the top 10 worldwide of 100 comparison. And it basically came down to what I refer to as the five T's. Talent, transportation, training, technology, and transparency. And in a world of uncertainty, <coughs> companies, big, medium, and small, are looking for certainty. So if you can give them certainty around talent, certainty around transportation, certainly around training and education, certainty around technology, and certainly around public finances, the transparency, they will have the confidence to then make a decision to move, relocate, or expand. Now, for the last five consecutive years, Chicago is the number one city in the United States for corporate relocations. For the last six consecutive years, Chicago is the number one city for direct foreign investment in America. And it's the only city in the United States in the top 10 worldwide, so last year, London led the world, Paris, Singapore, Amsterdam, and the city of Chicago. Now, if I asked you to pick a city in the United States that would be in the top 10 worldwide for foreign investment, which is a four or five trillion dollar account, you'd have picked New York, the Bay Area, Seattle, Miami, Boston, but Chicago led. So the focus has been on talent. Chicago has more universities than any other city in the United States but Boston. And if you drive, drive a or draw a 200 mile radius around the city of Chicago, we have more level one research universities than any other city in the globe. 39.5% of the people in the city of Chicago have a four year college degree. New York is 37, LA is 33, Houston and Philadelphia are 32 respectfully. Not that I'm competitive, but I thought you should know that. And in a, in a scour of talent, where companies are looking for talent, 39.5% and continually growing and outpacing the rest of the country is essential for the city's success. Keeping not only the kids that go to the 17 colleges and universities in the city, but then drawing talent from the University of Michigan, University of Wisconsin, Notre Dame, Purdue, into the city, key for our growth. The second thing is the training and what I'm proud of in the city the mayor in the Chicago owns what are called community colleges. I don't know what the translation here would be, but it's a two-year institution versus a four. And I set up that if you get a 3.0 in Chicago public schools, I make community college free. And maybe that doesn't translate here a lot, but in the States, that's a big deal. And it's the first and only public scholarship that a dreamer can get in America. 
meaning if you're not a citizen by your parents, et cetera. And if you then keep your B average, all the colleges and universities in the city of Chicago give you somewhere from 20 to 40% off of tuition. So a lot of kids are now going to college with, and get emerging, graduating debt free, which is a major, major challenge in America. But my guarantee is that if a company moves, they can get a graduate from Booth or Kellogg, DePaul, Loyola, Notre Dame, Michigan, Wisconsin, Columbia, Art Institute, or Harold Washington, Malcolm X, and all the other community colleges in the city. And that talent certainty is a big, big advantage. Second, transportation. O'Hare Airport was rated number one best connected airport in the United States, number two in the world behind Heathrow. By the time Heathrow figures out the third air runway, we'll have all eight runways operating in the city of Chicago. We're now expanding and creating the first global alliance terminal in the United States. We're going from four and a half to seven and point two million square feet of terminal space. So we're not sitting on our lead, we're investing in that lead. Our public transportation system has a 97% on time arrival. So all these factors of certainty in the public space and certainty around talent, certainty around training, certainty around transportation have created an economic promise for Chicago. Not only is it the leader in corporate relocations, not only is it the leader in direct foreign investment, today in Chicago, we have the lowest unemployment rate in the history of the city. We have the highest employment since 1950 when they started recording it. And while our poverty has dropped by 19% in the United States, poverty over that same period of time dropped by 12%. Meaning more and more people are actually not only going to work but lifting themselves since we raised the minimum wage and expanded the earned income tax credit. More are joining a working environment that I think is essential to lifting people out of poverty. Of the 99,000 people since we raised the minimum wage in Chicago have been lifted out of poverty, 45,000 of them are children. And so we've made not only an impact on jobs and on growth and employment, but also in reducing poverty at the same time. Lastly, I'll then talk about education, which is why I ran for the city and for the mayorship. When I ran, Chicago had the shortest school day and the shortest school year in the United States of America. And other 7,000 school districts, it is really hard to be dead last in time. But we figured out how to do it. So in that period of time, we've added four years of educational time to a child's education. Full day pre-K for all four-year-olds, full day kindergarten for all five years old, an hour and 15 minutes to every day, and two weeks to every year. Stanford University professor Sean Reardon when studying Chicago public schools, called it the best in the United States, outperforming 98% other school districts. We now are one of the leaders in reading gains, math gains among elementary kids. And more importantly to me also, is our graduation rate went from 56% to our freshmen on track is uh, towards 89%. All of you, I don't know everybody in this room, we have a lot in co two things in common, the love of our parents and a good education. I don't know what you're going to do the rest of your life, but you went to Oxford, you're going to succeed. You have to, as mayor, since you have a responsibility in Chicago, ensure that everybody else has a ticket and a passport, to, and which means your education, to succeed in the world at offering all these opportunities. And the reason I ran is to take us from a kindergarten high school to a pre-K to college model. This year, 50% of the high school graduates coming out of Chicago public schools will graduate with college credit before they hit high school graduation day. Ensuring, especially, 84% of the kids that go to Chicago public schools come from poverty. And if you're going to ensure somebody breaks out of the cycle of poverty, you have to ensure they get an education, they're more familiar with what's expected next. Starting next year, to get and to graduate high school and get your diploma, and we're starting with a lot more counselors starting your freshman year, you'll have to produce a letter of acceptance from either college, community college, vocational school, or a branch of the armed forces, ensuring that every child that goes to public schools has an educational plan upon graduation day, 
not just my children, not just other children or certain elements of the city. 44% of our kids today graduate high school, go to college. In the United States, it's 44%. So even though our demographics are more challenging, we match the United States with kids going to college. 21% of the kids that go to a community college in the United States when they graduate high school, in Chicago it's 20%. So we are meeting the national norms even though the every demographic for us is more challenging. Proving that if you raise expectations with support, kids can meet it regardless of what their zip code is or their background. And I think that's essential if you're gonna make sure, and this is a challenge, we'll talk about this. If you wanna be a world-class city, I know I talked to Mayor Khan from London, mayors in New York, et cetera, after we all talked to each other about how important and great our cities are, the single biggest challenge we have going forward is how to create what I call inclusive economic growth. Meaning that while this can be a great world-class city with great opportunities, cultural, educational, ed uh, economic, business, if you don't create a bridge where everybody has a chance at that success, not a guarantee, but a chance, then you're not gonna be the city you can be. And the only way I know how to make sure that that happens is through the opportunities that education provides. There are other things you have to do as a mayor on transportation, investments in neighborhood and communities, so they're places of hope, not despair, and there's a lot that goes into it. But you can't get from here to there without an educational system. And today, as I said, there's about 100 cities that drive the economic, intellectual, and cultural energy of a world economy. Chicago's one of them. And while Washington, I somewhat refer to as Disneyland on the Potomac, you guys may be thinking that way about Brussels and about London, your cities are becoming more and more important in handling issues like climate change, immigration, economic policies of inclusiveness on both what you do in the neighborhood or what you do at the schools. And mayors today have to do things that they never had to do 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago. So when I leave tomorrow, I go to Paris, we're meeting the C40 on climate change. And we're setting up policies today as mayors around environment and meeting our Paris goals by 2025, regardless of what our president did on the climate change treaty. In Chicago Public Libraries, we have 82 of them. Every library has a area where we call citizenship corners. We help people get, meet the requirements to become citizens of the United States of America. We have our own basic immigration policy. Regardless of what the United States says, if you get a B average in our public high school and you're a dreamer, meaning your parents aren't citizens, we still provide you access to publicly funded schools for higher education, running an immigration policy. I happen to think that one of the most important natural resources in the next 50 years, unfortunately too many wars are already being fought over it, is access to fresh water. Chicago's on the Lake Michigan. We have an abundance of fresh water. I took every one of the research university presidents in Chicago, flew them with me to Israel, where they have a scarcity of water, and signed research agreements on conservation and conversion on water. Did I call the State Department? Even if you called, nobody would answer the phone. <laughs> Did I call the Commerce Department, the Energy Department? No, but as a mayor, I wanted Chicago to be at the forefront of water research and the technology around water research. It's not gonna become less of a resource that people care about, it's only gonna raise an issue. But I led that effort and that's what's gonna happen going forward and continuing. And you're gonna see more and more mayors today, and I think in 10 years time, when you look through the rear view mirror, you're gonna see the inflection point around this period of time where we expect less from nation states and more from our local governments. I'll close on this thought. In a time of political uncertainty and a time in which people feel alienated from their national governments, the government that's most immediate and intimate in the public's life is local government, and it is also the government people feel they have the most influence on the decisions that influence the way they live their lives, which is why I've wanted to become the mayor of what I consider the greatest city in the greatest country in the world, which is the city of Chicago. 
And the last thing, and I think this is why I really care about it, about 100 years ago, my grandfather on my mother's side, 13 years old, left, left Eastern Europe and the pogroms of Eastern Europe to go to Chicago to meet a third cousin he didn't know. He had a fifth grade education, was a truck driver, a meat cutter, and a steel worker. And in two generations, his grandson is the mayor of that city. That tells you the promise and the possibility of Chicago. And it uh, means a lot that you can be the uh, son and the grandson of an immigrant and then rise to be not only mayor, but chief of staff to the president. And I think that's something unique about the United States and clearly unique about the city of Chicago. Thanks. So thank you very much for the speech. I just wanted to follow on from that. So you talked about you work with creating economic certainty with preserving water and climate change. How hard is it for a mayor when you're working against an administration that is trying so publicly to do the anti antithesis to that agenda? Well, I mean, I, so up until 2016, I was mayor with a good friend in the White House. I prefer that versus what I have now. But that said, um, you know, I declared about two years ago that Chicago would be a Trump-free zone. Um, and the, uh, it is, would be better, for a whole host of reasons, to ha not have a president that was trying to figure out how to divide Americans based on race, based on ethnicity. It'd be better to have, not just personally in a sense of resources, but a president who created an environment, take a conditions like when we had the incident in Charlottesville, Virginia, that somehow he created a moral equivalency between a bigot and those fighting bigotry. It would be much better with a mayor of a major urban area. We have 140 languages spoken in our public schools. It'd be better to have a president who found the commonality of our human character than the ones who find ways of dividing us. You don't need help dividing us. The current's moving that way. You need a president who pushes against the current and reminds us of our common citizenship. Then what do you see the role of a mayor who's trying to do, do the opposite to that kind of agenda in that climate? Where did you see your position? Well, you have, to speak, you have to speak up for your city and its values. And you have to, uh, immigration is a key one, but even on climate change, there are, and even on economics, you have to speak up on behalf of what you think, A, what you care about, and B, not just what you care about, but also what your citizens, which are hopefully aligned, care about. And I, so let me just say, so I told you already, Chicago has 140 languages spoken in its public schools. Our Mexican population, if it was a city in Mexico, is the fifth largest city in Mexico. So it's not like a minor part of the city. Second, outside of Warsaw, Chicago has more Poles than any other city except for Warsaw. That's also true, I mean, of people of Swedish descent, it's also true of people from Eastern Europe. And if you're trying to make, look, I told you my family's journey. My dad's from Israel. My grandfather on my mother's side is from Eastern Europe. If you took a family from Mexico, forget the language and forget the faith differences. Those parents have the same aspirations for their kids that my parents had for my kids. It may be spoken different at the home, it may be a different faith, but the, asper the reason you leave Mexico, the reason you leave Moldova, is because you think Chicago has a better promise on your child's future. And to me, that is what you gotta speak to. It would prefer a president, not just one that I agreed with politically, but one that I share a common sense of America's mission. And this is not a president that is doing that at home, let alone abroad, and therefore you have a responsibility to use your platform as mayor to speak up for. Then I wanted to jump and talk about something a little bit different for a couple of minutes. So especially in regards to this chamber, uh, it's, this topic is especially poignant, because two years ago we hosted the Mothers of the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. and this coming weekend we're hosting three of the founders of the March of Our Lives movement. So in that context of race relations, especially with the police department and 
gun mm -hmm. violence. How alarming do you think the issues of police race brutality and gun violence are now as you leave office, mm -hmm. is when you entered it? Well, so they're, they're related and separate. So let me try to break it up and deal with both. You know, when I would work for President Clinton, my role was I was the point person to pass the five-day waiting period to purchase a gun, the Brady Bill, and I was responsible for passing the assault weapon. And in Chicago, if you want to understand the issue of gun violence, you've got to understand the role of guns and gangs. If, so Indiana is about a 30-minute drive from Chicago. You give me an order and I can pick up anything you want plus twice of it. No questions asked. And you can drive right over the border, come right back. And if you don't under, and 40% and of the guns we pick up are bought right outside the city limits. Last year, the last two years, our police officers, last year, we took 9,600 guns off the streets of Chicago. A record high. And the year before, a record high. 9,600 guns comes to one an hour. So if you want to understand that issue, and what I want to give our police credit for and our community groups working with our cops, is in the last two years, overall gun violence is down 30%. January it was down to a 10-year low, and that's from working together. Now on the relationship part, like every other city in America, we're, we, like Baltimore, like New York, like Seattle, like Pittsburgh, we're working on that. But let me give you one example. And I don't want to over, overcompensate on what that example means, but I do think it means something. So in the 11th district in Chicago, about six weeks ago, and the 11th district is on the west side, which is a more challenging neighborhood, and the 11th district of the 22 in the city is the more, most difficult from a gun violence perspective. Uh, during the day, a young woman told the police that that car has guns in it. Five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, there was no way she was going to tell the cops that. Now, the reason she felt comfortable is you built a level of trust between her and the local police. I would argue four years ago she went to have that. Between that gang and her fear of them, and she said, you know what, my safety is with respecting that fear, or that officer and my safety is aligned with that trust. She picked trust over fear. Does that mean that every day we win every day like that? No, but it is an illustration that there was a change that you have to work on, and the superintendent and I always make this point, every interaction is a teachable moment, on the upside and on the downside. And we're in the process, not only adding 1,000 officers, but retraining them in a professional, proactive way. Every officer gets now trained on de-escalation, which we never did before. Every officer gets trained on separating a mental health call from a crime call. Every officer is getting trained on a, and when I say up, meaning senior members, not just new recruits, on a new community policing um, uh, paradigm. So it's a work in progress. What I do know is that robberies and burglaries are down this, so far this year, a 20 year low. So that's not a statistical mistake. And January was the lowest in 10 years. And last two years was down 30%. But nobody walks around and goes, you know, I feel 30% better than I did in 2016. It's whether a child can go to school thinking about their studies, not their safety. And that's really more of a mental state than it is anything else, and we're working on it every day. So as you leave office, are you hopeful that the reforms that you introduced have been institutionalized? And you think this that, Well, I think this. We have a cons there, so over the last 100 years, how many police reform attempts do you think there's been in Chicago? Seven. You did your research. You could have said it out loud, you would have passed the test. Uh, this time is different because you have a federal judge with a monitor. I think we have a really good superintendent with a good leadership team who are not resistant. So we've tried 100 times to reform our police department. I think this will stand the test of time. Now, before I became mayor, there was a thing called the Shackman Decree, 
which is federal oversight of the hiring practices in Chicago. It existed for 20 years. A judge had oversight into our hiring because politics influenced it rather than professionalism. Within my first three years, I met all the standards the judge needed. It was lifted. I believe, I, I'm not going to put a time limit because I don't know how long, but I know that you can't get outside the federal oversight of your police department until you've met not only the standards, it's wired into your DNA culturally. We're in the middle of hiring 1,000 officers. We're almost at the end of it. A third, call it anywhere from 20 to one third, 20% to one third of the Chicago Police Department was hired in the last four years. Meaning those officers only know this world. They don't know the police department of 20 years ago, of 15 years ago. So part of it is bringing in new blood and part of it is a leadership that is leading to a better day. And it's a work in progress. But that is different also, but let me say one thing. The gun issue is not 100% is not different, but it is distinct and different than community relations. So then, you said that there's a lot of teachable moments in every peak and trough. What are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned? To come to Oxford much earlier in my career. Uh, so, um, you know, um, there's a couple, so I'm very proud, I've said this, uh, now let me back up. The most important thing you learn from is your failures, not your successes. Um, while I'm very proud of what we've accomplished, not just in the results of education, but what we've done policies to influence those results. My biggest failure, or one of, and I've said this before, relates to education. Back up, in my first year of may being mayor in 2011, I'm living under, not living, but the last, nego in the last year representing the last negotiated contract of my predecessor exist. Now in 2003 and 2007, my predecessor tried to raise the time in academics from 30 minutes and then 45 minutes. And he got nothing. In each of the succeeding years of those two contracts, which were four-year contracts, the teacher's salaries went up 4%, and there's a thing called step and lame, so another 2% each year. But educational time did not change. When it came to the last year of the last contract, it was another 4%, et cetera, and we didn't have the money. And a mayor in Chicago has the authority and the ability, which no mayor had exercised, to cancel it in the middle of a contract. I did that. It set off bad relationships. I owned that. It was a mistake. I should have called the head of the union. She may have told me to go pound Sam, but I would have given her the chance to at least express coming up with ideas how to make changes with me to save some money. And that set off a bad relationship. Karen, and we're at both points in our lives, we talk, we email or text and communicate a lot. She has her own pieces of our relation, but I made that mistake and I have violated my rule that even when you disagree with people, you gotta give them a chance to be heard. And I didn't do that. And I think the final question I have before we're going to throw it over to the audience is that looking ahead with the Democratic primaries in the 2020 race, without discussing any candidate in particular, but today with Bernie Sanders jumping in, the, kind of the, the field is expanding. What kind of candidate and what kind of message do you think stands the greatest chance of winning in 2020? Well, it's not an unfair question to ask about message, but I'm not going to answer that for you. No, I will. Uh, Here's, first of all, let me say this. Before you get to where somebody is on ideology, I think there's way too much coverage about whether a candidate meets your ideological um, requirement. Two weeks ago, there was a poll by Mammoth, a big pollstering operation, that said by 54 to 32%, people wanted somebody that could win versus somebody they agreed with 100%. So my big thing is authenticity, credibility, and electability. And I think a process will prove somebody's authenticity, of who they are. And by way of example, in New Hampshire, when Bill Clinton was 
getting the crap knocked out of him, out of himself. I probably was getting the crap knocked out of me too. He said, the hits on me will be nothing like the hits on your kids if we don't turn this country around. And he was able to show why he was in this. It wasn't for him getting elected. It was for him getting elected to do something to affect your, your kids, your future. In 92, we were in the midst of a recession. And I think that revealed something. And then he came back and said, I'm the comeback kid, even though he didn't win. They thought he won New Hampshire because he went out first. That was a revealing moment of Bill Clinton. And that, uh, only a primary can show that. Now, I happen to think this mo there's five things we don't know that would influence how I answer your last question. We don't know whether Trump gets primaried. We don't know whether the economy feels like it's in a slowing down, not what an economist would say, but how the people feel in their wallet. We don't know whether Mueller and the New York State, what they're gonna say. We don't know who we're gonna nominate, and we don't know the process of how we're gonna nominate them. Those are big unknowns. But I feel that the biggest thing that I'm looking for from a message or whatever is what the way Ronald Reagan answered and sparked something in America at the very moment of Jimmy Carter's Melis. And it's not really his, but what he said. And I think, you know, I, don't, I say this somewhat cynically, not cynically, but critical, but also Donald Trump's greatest contribution is civic engagement. There's a level of engagement in politics today that I've never seen. And not, have not seen in my 25 years of practicing or 24 years of practicing politics. And I would call upon the American people to aspire to something higher because I don't think the American people in their instincts, in their bones, in their DNA, think this is right. And I think somebody that's able to articulate that in a way that puts people on a common purpose with a common mission can, and touches that spark. And part of that touching it is that their own story. Bill Clinton was a person from Hope, Arkansas who believed in the promise and the hope of America. Barack Hussein Obama was somebody who wrote a book called The Audacity of Hope. Both are aspirational. And I think that our nominee without being Pollyannish, has to, be, has to be and speak to that aspirational part of the American character. And you can't get that until they have that moment or moments in the campaign. Right, um, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, <laughs> God, shut up. Right, yeah, let's get a hand. <laughs> wow. Uh, thank you. Yes, hi, um, my name's Emmy. And first, I just want to thank you for being here. It's nice to see another new Trier grad in this, in this town. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll, I'll say hello to your parents for you. Thank you. Um, so my question is, uh, with the rise of city-states and the increased importance of local governments that you mentioned uh, in your talk, how do you see the role of, uh, of city mayors having changed over uh, your tenure? And how did you personally adapt to those changes as they occurred? You said it was Amy? Emmy. Emmy, oh, I apologize. So, I mean, I gave you two examples when I spoke, or three, one on immigration, one on climate change, one on like the, uh, and the thing from the water, you know, my first bill as a congressman was the Great Lakes Restoration Act to save Lake Michigan environmentally, ecologically. But I, what really seared it in my mind was when I was uh, first week of being chief of staff to President Obama, economist Jeffrey Sachs came to me, I happened to be meeting with him, and he showed me a map of every war, border war, and every civil war in the world. And then he showed me a map of every drought in the world. And you thought you were looking at the same map. And the reason I gave you the example is, I, if I waited for the Commerce Department or the State Department to sanction a visit to Israel, I would still be by the phone waiting. And so those are things that were never done before that we're now doing as mayors. I think mayors, given our metropolises, our populations, have a common interest given our contribution to climate change to help resolve it. Now, it'd be better again to have a national government 
aligned with that, then doing it, then doing it on our own. But we don't have the luxury of waiting. Now, I also think, and I will say this, I'm not happy about the atrophying of a nation state. When you think of technology, you think of climate change, and you think of uh, kind of the economy, those are forces that are bigger than a municipal budget. And not having an ally, and I don't mean the individual, but a national government aligned makes what I have to do as a mayor harder. But I think you're going to see a whole host of issues in 10 years, the role of mayors. Do you really think they're going to become less influential on international and, and, and national issues or more? Take in the states, transportation, infrastructure. It's only going to go up. Climate change is an example. Transfer of technology, access to higher education. So I wrote a piece about this, but it's, uh, the Wall Street Journal just did it. So Chicago, we have free community college. It's called Chicago Star Scholarship. Tennessee has it. Arkansas, Kentucky just passed legislation to do it. The governor of California just announced they're going to do it. Oregon, Hawaii, and Rhode Island have it. Here you have four Democratic governors, three Republican governors, all doing the same thing. And here's what's changed. You guys all study things like the New Deal, right? Ideas that start here, and Franklin Roosevelt takes it into the White House to make it part of the New Deal. Ideas are no longer going to flow up. They're going to flow horizontally. So Boston is now looking at free community college. Louisville is now looking at free community college. Do you see anybody getting on the plane and saying, hey, let's go tell Betsy DeVos at the Department of Education? Do you think she's calling us all together and saying, what do you have learned? What is the best model? Now, I did it because I was on my own. You had to get a B average. Maybe we shouldn't make it around a grade point average. Maybe you should just be open. Now, I couldn't afford it on my own. But to me, the ideas and what you're going to see are going to move horizontal. I'll take a stab. I don't know the facts. Worst case scenario, you'll come and haunt me down with this TV camera that we recorded. Why is, it, why is it that Chicago's poverty rate dropped by 19%, but the nation dropped by 12? I bet you if you go study the cities that raise the minimum wage, you'll have seen that the in, in minimum wage actually had an impact on income. And other cities saw a similar, more significant drop in the country as a whole. Mao, has Washington passed a minimum wage? The last time they did it was 2007. But 20 plus or 30 plus cities all passed minimum wages. And I think those are things are going to move horizontal, not vertical. And that's only going to increase because they have to. Okay? Let's take, yeah, let's jump to you said, hang on a second, right? No, this is this uh, Yes, my name is Timo, and uh, you said that you learned more from your failures than from your successes, and you mentioned one of the failures that you did as a mayor of Chicago. So my question would be, what is uh, the biggest failure or regrets that you have about being chief of staff to <laughs> President Obama? He probably would say, pick me. Uh, Why is that? Uh, you know, well, look, I mean, failure is chief of staff. Well, I'll give you one. I wouldn't call it the biggest failure, but I think it was a mistake. And as chief of staff, I should have caught it. Um, and again, I don't think it's, it's a mistake. Other people should have caught it, but as chief of staff, given my history, my family, my background, I should have caught it. So President Obama's first trip overseas, he goes to Saudi Arabia, gives a major speech at Cairo University, goes to Turkey, and, no, and he doesn't go to Israel. If you're the number one ally of the United States, and you know Israel only takes risks for peace when they have comfort level. Going to Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Turkey and not stopping in Israel is not exactly a settling moment. And as somebody whose father's from Israel, spent his childhood there, worked for President Clinton on the Middle East peace process, we should have had enough, as we would say in my home, enough sechel to have realized that was sending a horrible message. 
not one that would give them a comfort level to take risks on behalf of peace. Then we went on to Europe, and uh, he went to Germany, visited Dresden, and then went, uh, because I think it was the 60 year anniversary of D-Day, and went to Point, you know, Juno, all the landings. And I think when you look back at it, there's a series of things you could see between U.S. and Israel relations. That's not the only thing, but a series of things that that was a mistake. And we should have been smart enough that when you're planning a trip and a lot of months go in, that if you're going to go to the Mideast and you have time for Saudi Arabia, you have time for Egypt, and you have time for a major address to reset America's relationship with the Muslim world post George Bush, and you get time to go to Turkey, that just maybe you want to touch down in Tel Aviv for five seconds at least. And that set things off. Could you recoup from it? You could have. But I think it doesn't take me to tell you what's been in the newspaper, that it wasn't exactly the easiest. There are other things historically, other factors, etc. And I should have been smart enough as chief of staff to have caught what that would have said. Let's the hand to Although I will say, there's some other smart people that could have caught it too, but I don't have <laughs> Where? Okay. Um, okay, my name's Becky. Um, kind of following off of your question just then, do you think that the issue of Israel has become a partisan issue in American politics? So obviously Bibi is running for re-election now and his uh, promoting all of his campaigns with pictures of Trump and is sort of touting how close he is to Trump. Uh, they're obviously very keen on promoting ties with the Republican Party. Where does the Democrat Party stand with relations to Israel? How does that progress? Is it kind of a one-party issue now? So, well, first of all, let me say this. Um, I'm going to widen your question. Uh, look, there's a lot of challenges going on. You, you're, you happen to have a Labour Party here that's being challenged about its views on Israel and Jews. In France, on the other side of the political spectrum, you have what are called the yellow vests, and they have some challenges, as recently in the paper, about Israel and Jews. Um, you have some comments that a lot of people feel that the right wing in America have made around George Soros and others that are, have tinges, if not overt, but definitely implicit, that have okay, taken anti-Semitic tone. Um, so I would not restrict this to just what's happening in the Democratic Party. And I think I'm proud that the leadership in Congress swiftly condemned the member of Congress who spoke about why members of the Democratic Party or Congress support Israel has nothing to do with fundraising, but has to do with maybe shared ideals of democracy. Which I want you to know, in the upper Midwest, she actually represents the most highly concentrated Jewish community in Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, Idaho, and Wisconsin. And they sent twice now two Muslims to Congress, which may say something about the Jewish community. Number two, historically in the United States, Israel has been a nonpartisan issue through Republican and Democratic presidents and through Republican majorities and Democratic majorities in Congress. This is not the reason but I don't think it was helpful that Prime Minister Netanyahu accepted then Speaker John Boehner's invitation without a, contacting the administration, Barack, Obama, Barack Obama's administration, that he was going to speak to Congress on the Iran deal. It set off a series of further tremors in politics about support for Israel. Not the problem, not the sole source of the problem, but not helpful in keeping Israel a bipartisan cause rather than a partisan cause. And I don't think that's a good idea and was not helpful. There are issues, uh, and I think that I can have a lot of disagreements about Israel and the, the way the prime minister acts, et cetera, or a government makes a decision. And that doesn't mean just because I'm Jewish I'm allowed to do that. But I do think we should be cognizant all of us who are in advanced democracies about we're criticizing Israel jumps the tracks into sometimes being not about Israel but about 
being also anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish. Doesn't mean every criticism is that, but it doesn't mean not because it, because it is a criticism that it isn't that as well. Yeah, let's jump to the hand. And then you gotta. Thank you, my name is Camille. Camille? Camille, yeah, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, so I'm wondering how you can get on camera and cry after suppressing evidence from the CPD about the murder of a young man in cold blood and how corruption has impacted your office, political career, and legitimacy. Also and how you sleep at night. How corruption has impacted your office, political career, and legitimacy, and how do you sleep at night? Well, Thanks. first of all, let's take political corruption. I've spent 24 years in public life. I've never hired a lawyer for anything I've done. So you may want to say, oh, you're from Chicago. I've been in Congress. I've served two White Houses, and I've been mayor for eight years. I got three months left starting today, and I plan on walking out with my character and my integrity. You are also talking about the person that actually had a federal judge said, you know what, the changes you made, no longer political influence influences hiring. I was the one that in three years did something that had not been done for 20 years. Third, when I was a congressman, and I got then Senator Obama to introduce with me, that became law, I'm the law. I, I'm going to tell you about my career. Uh, we introduced and changed the laws as it relates to lobbying and ethics, and we're on our fourth iteration of reform in, as mayor. Now, as you probably know, there's uh, Alderman Sawyer, head of the Black Caucus and City Council. And as he said, there was no cover-up related to uh, the police shooting. We just had a federal investigation. They also said that. That doesn't mean I'm not responsible for making the changes necessary to professionalize the police department. So I happen to think that if you look at my record, look at everything I've done, you'll make the judgment, as will I, about what we have done in my tenure. Let's jump to the hand uh, at the back, you sir. Um, hi, I, my name's George. I wanted to dig a bit more into the climate change issue because you, yourself and a number of other city mayors have been incredibly vocal on what you will do as a city on climate change. Um, and obviously through networks like C40, there is a lot of potential to scale up what you're doing. But a lot of people, including at this university, think it's still not gonna be enough for the scale of the challenge that we have. Yeah. So I want to hear like, in your perspective, your time as mayor, what have been the major barriers to scaling up city climate action? Um, and how would you like to see those overcome um, in the next couple of decades? Thank you. Well, there's two, there's, so let me try to answer it this way, George. One is, when I became mayor, we were the last city in the United States, major city, that had two coal plants producing power. Both were in poor communities. One was in Pilsen and one was in Little Village. And I sat down with the CEO and I told him, we can make this easy or we can make this hard but those plants are closing, and the kids in the neighborhood around those two had a higher asthma attendance to hospitals for you know, health and breathing. But short story, they closed. Second, I embarked on the largest expansion of retrofit. We have 53 million square feet under retrofit in the city of Chicago. And it's been, it's both public and private, and we've commi just committed ourselves on, for public buildings, to be totally renewable. And obviously done major investments. Our school bus, our city buses are gonna go all electric. I forgot the year, but I think it's like by 2040. Um, there's the first city to have the five star on energy for buildings, et cetera. So there's a lot of different things we can do. I think the biggest, we're about 40, 41% of our way towards meeting Paris by 2025. Obviously a lot more to do, but cities have an overabundance of contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, whether that's in the commercial residential buildings or in the transportation system. So we actually, we have a bigger responsibility to lead. The other piece is every urban area also has a high concentration of poverty, and therefore the impact 
on communities from a resilience standpoint is also disproportionate. And just before I left, Chicago issued, we're the largest city to issue, our resiliency plan to how to help homeless and poor, et cetera, not just climate change, but other factors deal with impacts of how climate change, because if you're wealthy versus poor, your ability to adjust, adapt is different. Um, but cities are gonna have to lead and take bigger steps. There are things that we can do in purchasing, whether that's energy or converting. We're in the midst right near of a four year plan, our second year, all our street lights are going LED on a smart grid system. It'll make about a 2%, 3% different in our ability to get to Paris by 2025. But again, those are things that we can do that contribute in our way. And um, I think those are significant steps, but it, you need in the end of the day, like the state of Illinois to announce X about what they're gonna do about renewables. We can't do, we're not an island, but we can take a leadership role in these issues. And I think we've got time for two more questions. Um, yeah, left into the hand in the back, you sir. Uh, hi, my name's Ted. Um, my question was about Chicago as a city and it's um, the association it has had with political corruption. The um, mayor of uh, the race to succeed you is now well underway. Do you think that Chicago really needs a third daily in charge of it <laughs> uh, after the dailies have held the mayoral office for nearly 30 of the last 50 years? Do you think that maybe it's time now to carry on that march away from political dynasty and boss uh, rule that you, you sort of have started? Thank you. That I started? By being elected mayor rather than another daily. Oh, I thought you said that I st oh, started the dynasty. I was like, wow. <laughs> that, would come as, that would come as a DNA difference that I didn't realize. Uh, so let me, let me, look, let me back up here. I'm not going to speak about, I'm not back home and I'm not going to do it here. The city of Chicago residents will make their decision. I'm not endorsing anybody, so I'm not going to speak to a particular candidate. That's not right. What I can say is, and we, right now, there's an, uh, we have a situation where the longest serving alderman, who's been there for 50 years, is under investigation. As I said then, recently, and I'm gonna repeat, you can change all the rules and laws you want to what's legal and illegal. Only you can decide what's right and wrong. You can't make a rule for every action. I know what I have done in my careers as both a chief of staff, a senior advisor to a president, a member of Congress, somebody who ran the campaign to uh, return Congress to a Democratic majority, or as mayor. And what I've done myself and the people I've appointed. So you talk about Chicago, look. I mean, I'm not saying that we don't have a history, but you know, the governor's chief of staff in New York is under investigation. Former Speaker of the House in New York. The governor in Alabama and the Speaker of the House in Alabama are in jail. So it's not politics or the issue of corruption is not unique to Chicago. I know our history. I think I'm well versed in our history. But we have also done things to make fundamental changes to the rules so people are clear about what they're doing. Present candidates will make, it, make their case to the public why they deserve to be elected. A, f a singular family is not about corruption, but it's about that family's sense of obligation or service to the city. But I do think, I don't know all of you, and I assume some of you are interested in some capacity of doing some public service. I would argue that every person should find a way of serving the public at some point in their lives. Because you have to, should be, if you're fortunate, give something back that gave you that fortune. And I think public service, if I can be somewhat aspirational about, John Kennedy said it's an honor and a duty. I think it's one of the highest callings. It's unfortunate in the post-Watergate, post-Vietnam, public service has been degraded. But I do think 
It's a one place that you can still give something back, put your thumb on the scale, and tip it towards a place of equity and justice, if those are your aspirations. And you've got to make changes in the laws, which we have done under my tenure as mayor, and you've got to make changes in also the way you uh, lead your life in public life. And I think we have time for one final quick question. Um, you pick. Do you want to pick? Or no way. <laughs> Um, yep, sir, in the purple. Jump. I will say this, who have it, I'll stay behind, so if you haven't had a chance to ask, then you I'll... You to the bar. Uh, oh, to the bar? Yeah. That's where I'll do it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom Dowling from Chicago. I'm in the 19th ward with Matt O'Shea. <laughs> uh, so I, I have a question related to a topic you, you talked about earlier, which is our water resources in Lake Michigan. So as, a, as I'm sure you know, we've got nine elected commissioners that are responsible for the Water Reclamation District and seven of them are paid $70,000 a year, one is paid $75,000 a year, and one's paid $80,000 a year. Uh -huh. uh, do you think it would be a good idea to roll control over the Water Reclamation District into an executive office under the county so that we're not paying nine people tens of thousands of dollars every year? Hey, Tom, you get a second question. I'm not, I didn't come all the way to Oxford to get myself in trouble back home. Uh, uh, so let me say... Because uh, I, I could ask another. Yeah, why don't you ask, you know, Clinton used to have this great trick. I'll, ask, I'll answer your second question first, your first question second. But on a serious note, let me say this quickly. There's a lot of things that should be old structures, and this is, here's what I would say, let me take your question to a broader space. Um, when I first got elected, I then put, I collapsed revenue and comptroller's office into a single office. And people should ask some fundamental questions. Just because we did it this way 50 years ago, 40 years ago, does it still make sense? I'm not passing judgment on what you just asked, okay? Uh, but we have done and looked fresh at different things. That, uh, we've created an office, so I'll give you an example. I collapsed too. Uh, when I became mayor, there was, a, there was a department of planning and housing. I think the issue of gentrification, homelessness, affordability, required, so in my last budget, I pulled it out so you can get your own commissioner with your own department that work on a cross-section of neighborhoods that are gentrifying, and the big, one of the biggest challenges cities have today is how do you create environment for de development without displacement? The homelessness, while our population has declined three years in a row, is still a challenge. Affordability of purchasing a home or living in the city is still an issue, especially for people who want to do their first time so I created a new department that used to exist, was then collapsed, and I brought it back out. So you should be able to ask, is this the, if we were starting from fresh and we had a clean yellow page, would you create the structure we have today? Many, many ways the answer is no. And so then are you willing to change the structure to meet an objective at the right time? I'm not sure what you said about salaries, but I will say this about the metropolitan water sanitation. I've made reclaiming the Chicago River one of the most important things in my tenure, through the river walk, the boathouses. We were fortunate as a city, we had the lakefront. 30 years ago, there were seven species left in the Chicago River. Today, we're north of 78. It's a dramatic change ec ecologically. Could that have been done without the Metropolitan Water Sanitation District? No, they've been a partner. Does it mean that those salaries, et cetera, the way it's structured with the water department is the same? You could evaluate things. But my point is, what is the mission? And one thing I would say to all, the mission is what's important. The structure and the bureaucracy is a secondary to the purpose. Have they contributed? I can say without a doubt in my tenure, They've been a partner in the reclamation, ecological reclamation, that has been a big part of my tenure of the Chicago River, which had been ecologically de degraded over the last half century. Well, thank you very much. And we'll ask the second question in the bar. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, please do join with me. Unfortunately, that is all we've got time for. And say a big thank you to Mayor Ron. <laughs>